Money is a topic we've come to regard quite seriously. So serious, in fact, that many grown adults wait with bated breath for news of the latest figures on consumer prices and interest rates, which have real impacts on the perceptions of wealth and productivity. But what if I told you that money is just a game we play, a game like any other, with a variety of rules and objectives? Money is a symbolic thing that we use in order to achieve things of value and significance in the world. And hence, it's not an end in itself, like how a map is an abstract picture of the world. But the map can never substitute for the actual terrain it's meant to portray. A financial system is like a game board with pieces, obstacles, and various paths to success question is, are you aware of the kinds of money games that you play on a regular basis? Did you voluntarily join or were you born into a game whose rules were never explained and with a hand you didn't choose? People experience stress and anger when their concept of money is threatened. Prices of goods go up, asset prices fall, some people go bust and others get lucky. Too often we create our own anxiety because we haven't yet evolved our view of the proper role and meaning of money. It's not surprising we would get frustrated when we don't even know the rules of the game. We're further limited by viewing money in terms of dollars and cents rather than a fluid reservoir of potential energy. Much of the uncertainty simply evaporates when we adopt a less rigid view of money and get clear on the kinds of money games we want to be a part of. To get there, I want to discuss some clear examples of the association of games and money, followed by some more figurative ways we can apply the spirit of games to our work and our lifestyle and personal philosophy. But first, a disclaimer, and that is, when it comes to money, it's easy to equate gaming with gambling. And although that's a view you can hold, it's not among the things I'd hope for you to take away from this chapter. So it's worth clarifying, to chalk up all of finance to a game is not a reason to be cynical or nihilistic. On the contrary, it's a call for us to take an active role in our education as a participant of the economy in order to take our skills to the next level. We've seen what happens when making money is viewed in the most trivial sense, that is, we allow it to take the place of adding value and creating relationships. Money as an end in itself breeds corruption, the attention economy, and things like meme stocks. For example, the GameStop moment of 2021 marked a convergence of degenerate behavior that exposed the absurdity of a game that had always been held in high regard. The result was an indictment of the integrity of the stock market, where a group of Reddit traders called time out on market shenanigans, only to uncover a far more damning underworld of the fiat machine, where things like rehypothecation, selling order flow, and one-sided circuit breakers are business as usual. Many traders learned the hard way whose rules they were playing by. Many people are drawn to Bitcoin because it's a game that's simple to understand where network consensus depends on clear, unambiguous rules. The incentive is such that doing good by yourself is to do good by everyone. As such, it's easy to want to share a love of Bitcoin with everyone you know. (laughs) Kind of like I'm doing now. A typical Bitcoin transaction may be zero-sum in terms of net value, but the synergy of of the peer-to-peer network yields exponential gains to society. Gaming on mobile, PC, and console is a vast market and is growing every day along with increasing access to high-speed internet, making it one of the major frontiers of Bitcoin adoption. The play-to-earn concept is just the beginning of the match made in heaven that is Bitcoin and games. Earning sats for playing a game is an opportunity to become a better player. While getting familiar with the payment tech 
and it also helps developers incentivize players to explore new titles. Because Bitcoin is native to the internet, it's not limited in utility to one game, but portable across platforms. Many other in-game collectibles either aren't transferable or have a short shelf life in the digital world. Curiously, there have been real markets for game items long before Bitcoin entered the picture, and now trading items for real money can be done without ever leaving the, your favorite gaming chair. Whether you're switching games or logging off for the day, your Bitcoin balance can easily follow you. Say you're ready to cash out after a gaming session and decide to use your Bitcoin earnings to buy tacos down the street. I'd say that's my idea of augmented reality. Gamers will already be familiar with streaming paid content to their fans, and until recently this was accomplished through traditional banking and credit. Now Bitcoin reduces overhead at the point of sale, putting more sats in the pockets of the players. And streaming more generally is taking over the way content is made and consumed, and Bitcoin has transformed the landscape by enabling real-time micropayments. Creators benefit from this high precision feedback, which allows them to better serve their audience. If you're dead set on betting with your friends on Bitcoin's future price or the outcome of the World Cup, for example, you can do so without jumping through the many hoops typical of online gambling websites or by giving up custody of funds. Um, ben Carmen and others have... Uh, have pioneered the technology built on Bitcoin that allows for fully peer-to-peer -peer betting, all in good fun. It's tough to avoid trusting the oracle or entity that delivers a verdict on such a bet, but on the upside, all payouts occur automatically and settle on chain. Would you expect anything less from a smart contract? The culture and ethos of Bitcoin has reignited a passion in, in users to conduct more of their activities on a peer-to-peer -peer basis that extends not only to value exchange, but to messaging, file transfer, and all manner of computation. The internet was originally conceived with these features in mind, but along the way, the tech got better while users got comfortable relying on third parties. Pirating digital media became a problem for the entertainment industry as information got cheaper and has since been patched by the use of streaming subscriptions. But this may only be a bandage as it doesn't make peer-to-peer -peer tech any less relevant. Now the self-hosting revolution is back in full swing as people realize the value of freedom over censorship. For example, it might seem silly to send a text message to a friend over the Lightning Network, but it's possible and incredibly useful and the beauty is that there's no one snooping in the middle. A more practical application is the emergence of distributed markets for digital storage and CPU power. I, for example, might wish to secure an, an off-site backup of a hard drive, and a friend might be willing to host that data on their personal infrastructure for a small fee. I might then use my own computer to spin up a service for which I can be paid by making it available on the web. If you think about it, there's no reason we can't stream video calls peer-to-peer. -peer. We simply take for granted the fact that much of our communication flows through centralized servers. Sure, there may be a time and a place for using the cloud, but I would venture to say our ability to preserve the peer-to-peer -peer internet could mean the difference between free speech and censorship on a global scale. This is the essence of the game occurring on the front line of the war of information. Too much information in one place becomes a honeypot for surveillance and, and censorship. Financial surveillance is especially dangerous because human behavior is driven by economic incentives and collecting data on spending patterns is only a step away from believing behavior is a, a thing to be controlled. The fight for privacy is a game between the actions of individuals and the means of bulk data collection. In the past, there may have been a reasonable expectation of privacy and surveillance was the exception, but now the reverse is true. We assume we're monitored and recorded and only that which can be concealed from prying eyes has a chance of being kept private. 
although surveillance has made privacy nearly impossible in some respects, I wouldn't give up hope on financial privacy with respect to Bitcoin. Programmable money can be layered with new functionality. Whether it's used for freedom or for tyranny is a choice we must seriously consider. The right to privacy isn't granted, but it can be taken back and secured by improving our technical competence and understanding. When you measure all your possessions in terms of how much Bitcoin you could own it, own instead, it helps put your values into perspective. And I don't think this is an extreme attitude, but merely a useful thought exercise that helps you to decide whether it's really worth buying new crap instead of saving. Because saving Bitcoin represents the actual opportunity cost to every other decision to spend. National currencies have the opposite effect that I argue is to our detriment. Because we have an expectation of currency inflation, the incentive is to spend more today at the expense of tomorrow. Something very interesting begins to unfold in your life when you internalize the nature of Bitcoin as a deflationary force, and that is you start prioritizing the future, which has a remarkable effect on present behavior. You don't have to be naturally frugal, though it helps, in order to see the benefits of delaying gratification, which are both financial as well as psychological. Where the culture of instant gratification becomes a, a dopamine trap and hedonic spiral, saving for the future allows you to unwind and realign with the important things in life. This practice becomes a game in itself to gradually remove the excess from your life and connect with a deeper sense of fulfillment. Saving in, in Bitcoin is a perfect way to start gamifying your budget. Merchants will frequently offer discounts for paying in Bitcoin, and if you feel any sort of anxiety over breaking up with your credit card, you can even earn sats back on purchases with the right card providers. You might also discover ways to gamify your work, for instance, by earning Bitcoin for completing micro tasks or freelancing from any, anywhere in the world. Bitcoin mining at home is a natural consequence of the intersection between slashing living expenses and stacking sats. Admittedly, I don't have much personal experience in home mining, but I'm sure small-scale operations will become more common as the technology grows in ubiquity, or at least I hope so. Those that venture into mining can benefit from earning Bitcoin directly from the network without having to sign up with an exchange. And on top of that, capturing and recycling the exhaust heat of miners can help heat a living space or hot tub or, or greenhouse. Embracing a Bitcoiner's lifestyle and values inspires one to decentralize and self-host more of their personal data. But I would say don't be intimidated by believing that it has to be all or nothing. Personal sovereignty exists on a sliding scale, and there is a maturity in, in recognizing we still depend on the cooperation and permission of others in many aspects of life. The, the point is to exercise more autonomy in the areas of your life that matter to you and understand the trade-offs of delegating control elsewhere. You can gamify your own Bitcoin learning curve to increase your competence through testing and experimenting. As more work is being done online, we see an increase of nomads looking to optimize their physical and geographic surroundings. With your savings safe on a global ledger, you won't need much else with you in order to hop between jurisdictions. So there's no reason not to put a piece of your life or business on Bitcoin rails, regardless of your level of enthusiasm for blockchains and smart contracts and all the rest of it. There are convenient hand-holding solutions that will get you quickly accepting Bitcoin payments, followed by a range of open source tech with which you can build a more self-sovereign tech stack that includes self-hosting a, a Bitcoin node and a point of sale. By using Bitcoin for commerce, you find it's a lot less scary than imagined and more a huge improvement in user experience, mainly by cutting out a lot of red tape. 
anyone with a smartphone can shop at a farmer's market in, say, El Salvador, for example. And the merchant can lock in a dollar value on the spot if they choose, rather than speculate on Bitcoin price in their business. Plus, both parties enjoy instant settlement and no fraud risk. Since day one, Bitcoin adoption has been a story of game theory. Why a Bitcoin should have a price at all is testament to our inclination to behave in a game strategic manner. The reason to buy Bitcoin at a dollar was the same as it was to buy it at $100 and the same as it is today. What made 10,000 Bitcoins a fair price for two pizzas in in 2010? The logical explanation is that Bitcoin had graduated from a mere meme by bootstrapping a system of trust internally. The reason people developed faith in the world's preeminent cryptocurrency is not just the fixed supply of 21 million, but that your ownership in the network is secure and faithfully resilient. Some critics point to Bitcoin as simply a bet that a greater fool will buy you out, but this misses the point that we harp on more than price alone, that of censorship resistance, which is something legacy systems have been unable to deliver or replicate. And this is where the value of Bitcoin truly shines, and which is made possible by proof of work, among other things. People that realize the value and utility of Bitcoin are therefore not to be regarded as fools, but as evidence of our collective wisdom and humanity. Other nations don't necessarily need to decree Bitcoin as legal tender because people will speak for themselves, prompting governments to play catch up. Many believe the end game is to begin pricing the energy trade in Bitcoin because in the midst of widespread currency disruption, Nothing stops Bitcoin from, from emerging as a neutral reserve asset. To accommodate international trade, though, the, the network will need to grow in value to many times what it is today. And eventually the scarcity of 21 million will reflect in a logarithmic step up in price. The race for adoption will accelerate when neighboring countries see the real wealth accrued by competitors especially that which lies outside the walls of financial imperialists. Bitcoin is on a trajectory of its own and has no obligation to bend to the demands of despots. However, Bitcoiners are happy to build bridges technically and socially with those who are friendly to adoption and thus share a common vision. What makes a game fair and pleasant is the existence of clearly defined rules. Games like chess or poker persist through the centuries precisely because the rules don't change. That reliability doesn't take away from the richness of outcomes and possibilities. Rather, it enables such richness. The game of capitalism is what happens when people are left to their own devices where the economic rules derive from the physical constraints of nature and the basic assumption that people will hunt and gather resources to survive. No coordinated mandates were required for the pilgrims to trade with the Native Americans. They simply conducted voluntary exchange when it suited them. Man's attempt to intervene in markets and impose rules by decree, rules that often don't comport with reality, is to effectively rewrite the rules that favor the rich and this doesn't inspire confidence in others to continue playing the game. Money itself is boring when it does what it's supposed to do. That is, facilitate trade among economic entities. It's not something you invest in, nor do you attempt to diversify your money by holding incrementally inferior tokens. I don't store wealth in alternative crypto assets for the same reason I don't store wealth in airline miles. There can be a token for anything, just like there are loyalty points for coffee shops and department stores. But there's only one money because the best money is a magnet to the world's liquidity. To some, the idea of gamifying money means high stakes gambling 
and the compulsion to metaphorically dance while the music's playing. But I would encourage you to go beyond the, the temptation to speculate on tokens or to farm for black magic yield or to seek safety in uh, third parties and other people's liabilities. Instead, focus on the creative ways you can humbly stack sats and in doing so achieve greater amounts of freedom and more meaningful and impactful relationships. I'm reflecting on the words of Donald Hoffman, who gave a poignant reminder that none of our possessions and desires can we take with us when we inevitably shuffle off. Yet the story of me and my ego is very much a story of my accumulated wealth and achievements, or lack thereof. So to internalize the fact of my own mortality is to realize that all we can ever do is play games of all sorts, intellectually, spiritually, and socially. This is why I like to say we have to choose our own delusions because our deepest beliefs and most firmly rooted paradigms are nevertheless delusions in a cosmic or epistemological sense. It's better that we occupy the driver's seat of our cognitive machinery as opposed to someone else. And there's always someone else who wants to tell you what to see within your own VR goggles. But only you can experience what life, what life is like in your, in your head and, and heart. It's high time that we listen to what's on the inside. Ken Honda, in the book Happy Money, tells a story of a Japanese woman who asked to see the contents of his wallet to determine if his money was metaphorically smiling or crying. She was trying to ascertain the quality of Ken's financial karma, which would presumably tell the story of how he came to acquire money and its eventual fate after leaving his hands. So we can say your money obeys the laws of karma. If you earned it illegitimately, you may just as soon lose it to those who would take advantage of you. When two thieves pass each other in the street, they need no introduction. But if you earn it through doing work that is valuable and doing it kindly, then the rewards that, that come to you in return are innumerable. In terms of karma, we might say, to he who has, more shall be given. But from he who has not, even that which he has will be taken away. Forgive me for cross-pollinating religious tropes. Um, this line from the Bible is normally interpreted as the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. However, I'm sure most people you ask today would abhor the notion as, as a way to run a society. How then do we square that apparent disconnect? Are we to write it off as another case of outdated scripture? I think a wiser interpretation is that it's a corollary to the Bible's own expression of karma as we understand it in the West, which is to say, you reap what you sow. The question is, what does it mean to be rich? Having money is by no means a moral justification for how it was obtained. Horrible things of it have been done for money. But being rich in spirit begets more spiritual abundance, which makes people want to do business with you. A richness of spirit means having a growth mindset, sharing in value creation, and working to alleviate suffering, and thus goes beyond a richness of, of money alone. When money is corrupt, achieving sufficient privilege allows one to give more to themselves regardless of their contribution, and we observe pathological wealth concentration as a result. For the spiritually rich to get richer, I would say it's a necessary condition that other people choose to endow you with an increased stewardship of wealth, and this responsibility is earned through karma and goodwill. If you're too big to fail, then you don't feel the repercussions of destroying wealth and this is inherently corrupt because it allows one to continue to exert an influence through ill-gotten gains. 
However, when money is truthful, then exercising one's influence means spending their Bitcoin and therefore distributing rather than concentrating it. Stuart Wilde said the trick to money is having some. We think that's sort of obvious and on the surface not very helpful. Stuart must be playing with us. But I think there's a lesson here. The question is what to do with money once you've got it. And if we're honest, that's no different than the question of how one should live a life. I'm not sure we stop to ask ourselves this as often as we should. Am I living life in a way that's true to myself and valuable to others? If so, then my money habits ought to reflect my values and philosophy on life, or else I'm merely using money to project a falsehood and perpetuate suffering. How can I endow money with a spirit of love and gratitude as a thing I'm happy to spread rather rather than feel dirty, guilty, or envious toward? I can start by being grateful to my employers and clients, but also being grateful to my creditors. I pay them generously and ahead of schedule, and this works in my favor because they'll be happy to leave me be. But if I wait to pay people, then I let resentment build between us rather than appreciation. But money wants to flow, so my job is simply to be the agent through which it it may flow and do so in a way that makes the world a better place.